I'm Scott Malo. Uh, I am the current president of Months and Hears, and we have this really long title now uh, for our, it's the Munson Substance Abuse Community Partnership. Sorry about that, it's a mouthful. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for coming tonight. I just wanna quickly share how I uh, came about having Dr. Poti come and speak. I haven't really shared this with her yet, but when the green, when they had the, the state was going around and doing their uh, soliciting of the general public's thoughts on opiate addiction, Greenfield Mass was one of the ones where they were, uh, where they were up there uh, as a panel. And I remember Dr. Poti was one of the first people to go up and speak, and she read him the riot act. Uh, she could have literally just dropped the mic and, and walked away, and I think everybody would have got the point. So she said she hates introductions, so I'm just gonna turn it over to her. Thanks for coming. Thanks for Scott to being really a great organizer. He totally pulled this together. I am 100% a local girl. I grew up on Route 32, actually. Um, as I was driving on 32, I was like, I grew up on 32, not in Monson, but in a town called Petersham. But my dad was a primary care doctor at the Wing Memorial Hospital for 30 years. Um, and it's, he's the reason I became a doctor, actually. Um, and he's actually, in some ways, the reason I do this work. So same last name, and I, I bet some of your aunts and um, parents and grandparents actually had my dad as a primary care doctor. He was a great man. Anyway, so it's great to be here, actually. I love being here. Okay, so you guys are really far away in the back. I can see you, but I would love you to be closer. I'm not going to bite, and I like to actually look at people, so move at any point. And we're going to do probably questions and answers um, towards the end, but if there's something that I'm showing you you don't understand, stick your hand up and we'll correct it or, or make it more understandable. This is getting taped probably for like maybe community access television, so you can go back and look at it, but Scott has the slide deck and every one of you in this room can have the slide deck, and then you can go out and give this talk anywhere you want and you could tell them that you did the whole thing yourself. Don't credit me, just give it. Um, and you could choose to do parts of it, in fact, and, and I'm going to show you a website at the end where maybe you can practice, because the more we're able to spread the information about how the brain breaks with addiction, the further we're just going to advance as a community. So we're going to talk about the brain, and um, people think I come here and I talk about opiates all night. We get to opiates eventually, but actually I'm going to talk in a very big way about how the brain breaks with addiction. So this was the uh, lead article, the cover article in the National Geographic in September of this year, just two months ago. Anybody subscribe to National? You still get it, right? I hate to say it, you're a woman, two women of a certain age, but many of us have stopped subscribing. It's great, not you, I know. It's great, you guys should resubscribe because the National Geographic's are great. We all grew up getting it. Do you guys remember getting it as kids and then we all stopped subscribing? Well, I redid my subscription. This is a great cover article on the physiology of addiction. It was really accurate. Um, they had a lot of videos. You can Google it online if you want to go back because you're going to go give your practice talk somewhere else. Um, but it, what I, the story I'm going to tell you is also accurate. I'm going to simplify it a little bit because I have been to multiple uh, big uh, international conferences on addiction and I walked out of multiple lectures thinking I didn't understand that because how the brain breaks gets really complicated. So the part of the brain that is impacted by addiction, whether it's addiction to behaviors, addiction to gambling, sex addiction, or to substances like alcohol or opiates or marijuana, is the part of the brain that's known as the reward center of the brain. It's the deepest, most ancient, most elemental part of the brain, and it is the part of the brain that tells you to live or to die. It is the part of the brain that tells you every morning to wake up and find food and find clean water, keep your people alive, and in fact, it's the part of the brain that tells you to find a mate so you can send your genetic material forward. Because the entire purpose, really, in a real uh, evolutionary way, the entire purpose of us being on this planet is to survive long enough to create the next generations and to protect them, right? That's what your brain is prepared to do. Now, nobody thinks that, right? We all wake up in the morning and we're like, I got to go to work and, you know, tomorrow's Friday. I got the weekend. Tomorrow's Veterans Day. People may have tomorrow off. Today's Friday for a lot of people. So, you know, like that's what your brain is thinking, you think, but really the deepest part of your brain is telling you to survive long enough to send your genetic material forward. That is a fact. And we have not evolved from that. 
The problem is that is what addiction impacts. It impacts that part of my brain, the part of my brain that says, should I live or die today? And if I could pick up addiction and move it to any other part of the brain, and it went to your visual cortex, and all you did when you got addicted to alcohol is you lost your peripheral vision, be wicked easy to treat, right? I wouldn't let you like pitch on the pitcher's mound. I wouldn't let you drive tonight. Like it would be easy to treat. But instead, this thing that has to do with living and dying is the part that breaks. And that's why addiction's hard to treat. It's challenging. And people in this room who have family members who have struggled with addiction or who've had their own history with addiction and um, ha are working really hard to stay in recovery, it's a challenge. And if it were easy, I wouldn't be here tonight and you wouldn't be here either. So. We're gonna talk about dopamine, um, and I apologize that I'm turning around. I often have a computer screen so I know where I am, but I, I mostly know my slides. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter, the chemical um, in that part of the brain, the reward center. It has with it this really lovely spike of joy and euphoria and holy smokes that was awesome behavior repeated again. That's what dopamine tells your brain. And when it comes to finding food and water and having sex, those are helpful behaviors. Holy smokes repeat again, right? When it comes to addiction, not so helpful, but it's the same chemical and it tells you to do the same thing. It has with it associated two specific behaviors, compulsion and perseveration. I cannot stop thinking about this. Your ancestors were both compulsive and perseverators, and you're grateful for that, right? My entire front row, their ancestors stunk, right? They don't exist anymore. You needed your ancestors to be like this. You had to go to bed at night. The last thing you had to be thinking about is how am I gonna survive tomorrow? Because you know what? Our lives are so easy now, right? I just stopped and got gas. There were 30 billion calories at the checkout at a gas station. Seriously, right? But 100 years ago in Monson, it wasn't so easy. I mean, seriously, think about 100 years ago. You were hard scrabble farming. It wasn't so easy to farm around here. You certainly hope the cow made it through the winter. Maybe you were hunting. I guess some of us could fish a little bit, the Connecticut maybe, or another place you could fish, but your lives were tough. Yeah, there were some grocery stores 100 years ago. You could get food, but 200 years ago, think how hard that was, right? Our lives are a piece of cake in comparison, and we have not evolved. Evolution takes tens of millions of years. We have been in this form for only 200,000 years. So the point is, is that your brain is working very hard to survive all the time, and it's dopamine that allows you to do that, but it's also dopamine that gets hooked into this addictive behavior. So. I make an argument that at a baseline, we all have about 100 units of dopamine in our brain. Now, there's no way to measure this. You're not gonna go to the wing lab tomorrow and ask to have your dopamine levels checked because they're gonna think you're insane um, and they're gonna think I'm insane. But there's some of us who are happy-go-lucky people, like golden retrievers on the planet. We see, you know, everything is a, there's a silver lining to every gray cloud. And that is maybe our dopamine levels sit at 105 or 107 and that's just, genetics or luck or epigenetics, it's something. And then there's some of us, and I'm not talking those of us who struggle with depression, but there's some of us who are just sort of the dysthymics of the world. I have them in my family and we're sort of the lower energy. We have a hard time puzzling through problems. We can't figure out that things really are gonna get better. People like this often come to the doctor. I spend my day with my Eeyores of the world whose dopamine sits at about 85 or 90, right? And I'm trying to move them along, trying to find some positive spin on anything that they're feeling. So when we're all sitting with 100 units of dopamine in our brain and it's 150 years ago and you're out in the woods um, in, in Monson and you find that five point stag that you managed to kill with your bow and arrow and you think to yourself, holy smokes, I'm gonna keep my family alive for the next seven days, that is awesome, you get a dopamine spike. You get a spike, it goes to 150 and it goes back to normal. Because this is your brain's way of saying this is a repeatable behavior that's gonna help you survive, good work, right? You have sex, it's consensual, your dopamine will spike to 200 and then it goes back to normal. Because this is behavior that from an evolutionary standpoint you want to repeat. When you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine will spike to about 350. And when you use a strong prescription opiate or you use heroin, your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. And when you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will spike to about 1300. So what's amazing is that most of us don't get up every morning and take a hit of meth, right? Because I just described something that is like six times great sex, right? And you would think, actually, most of us would get up and think that's a good idea. Yet, you and I, all of us, are gonna understand why it isn't a good idea, because the brain does not like this. So, let's talk about the three 
parts of the equation that impact dopamine in the brain. There's how much dopamine gets produced. There how many, the, the second one is how many little receptors are on the other side of the synaptic cleft receiving the information from dopamine. And the third one is how many little vacuums come in and suck the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft. We get to impact one of those three things. And every addictive behavior, every addictive substance at the end of the day ends up impacting something along this little equation. So I'm going to show you two fast ones. Cocaine is the most easily understood addiction because it does only one thing, but it does it really nicely. It turns off the vacuums, shuts down the vacuums. And when you have no vacuum sucking the dopamine out of the synaptic cleft, that's how you get to a dopamine of 350. Opiates are more complicated because they go through an opiate receptor and then they go through a negative feedback loop through GABA. But at the end of the day, all opiates produce more dopamine. They just make more dopamine and shuttle it out into the active part of the brain. So when the brain has been used to seeing dopamine levels of 85 and 150 and 200 for you know 200,000 years, and the brain starts to see dopamine levels of 350, 500, 1,000, it freaks out. It says, this is not normal. This is not normal. There is this chemical in my brain that is going way beyond any normal limits. I need to turn down the volume. I need to downregulate. I'm going to erase 80% of my dopamine receptors. I'm going to stop producing dopamine naturally, and I'm going to turn on every vacuum in sight. So people who enter into addiction and have actually started to struggle with addiction, they wake up in the morning and their dopamine's not in 100, it's not 85, right? Their new dopamine set point is like 45. It is hard to have a shower, it is hard to pour a bowl of cereal and be nice to your children, it's hard not to call my front office staff terrible names when you call. You are a miserable human being. And in fact, your dopamine levels are sort of not even consistent with survival, right? And your brain's instinct is, holy smokes, I need to feel better than this. And the only way you know to feel normal is to continue the use, to continue to drink, to continue to look for heroin, to go, you know, go find your speedball of cocaine, do anything you can to feel normal again, right? The brain is telling you to do this crazy thing that most of us in this room think, please just stop. Yet your brain is telling you if you don't do this, you're gonna die, right? It's an awful, awful feeling. And if what we all can do as, as people in this room is try to prevent the disease of addiction for multiple generations, that's the goal to help people who need treatment, but also to help prevent it for future generations. So I think of this as the broken brain. Do you know, we could have done this with any other disease in the body. I could talk to you about the pathways of how tran transmitters get disrupted with diabetes or cardiovascular disease, because every disease other than cancer, which works a little differently, has to do with a disruption in messaging between chemicals. So I'm not describing anything that's bizarre, right? But it's just that most of us didn't know this. We didn't learn this. And you know, I never learned this either. I did not learn this in medical school. I went to a really expensive, top-notch medical school. I barely learned this in residency. I learned most of this out in the field much later in my career. So I'm going to talk to you about something that happened in all likelihood um, at Wing Memorial Hospital today. This guy in the upper right, um, Three Rivers, right? That's a neighborhood, right? I'm putting this guy in Three Rivers because I remember Three Rivers. So he shows up at the Wing ER. Um, let, me let me back up for a second. He's in his living room. He has his hand on his chest, and his wife says, honey, you don't look so good. And he's like, no, 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 it's OK. It's a little indigestion. And she's thinking, he's looking blue. He's turning gray. He's really not looking good. She calls 911. And the police from Palmer are the first ones probably to arrive, but EMS is there really fast. And they give him a sublingual aspirin and a nitroglycerin, and they give him a beta blocker. They put in a big bore IV. They give him. Um, some oxygen, and they transmit an EKG from that living room while they're putting him on that board into the ambulance to the Wings ER. And the Wings ER says, don't even stop here, right? Bypass us entirely, head state, straight to Springfield, to Bay State. Because this guy's having a massive interior wall MI, and tell them to start warming up the cath lab. He arrives at Bay State's ER, and they're like, we're not even bringing this guy to the cath lab. He's going to the OR. And he ends up with quadruple bypass surgery of his heart, right? They probably have to crack his chest because it's so emergent. He's in the cardiac care unit at Bay State um, Springfield for a, almost a whole week. He's in the uh, coronary telemetry unit for a whole other week. He gets a brand new cardiologist that's based out of the wing hospital. He gets to see me, his primary care doctor, for the first time because I've never met him before. 
Um, and he gets a social worker because he's going to be depressed. How much money we just spend on that guy? How much, she said? Yeah, she guessed half a million. I'm going to probably say a quarter million, right? Probably $250,000 was just spent to save this guy's life, which was really important. He's 68 years old, right? He, he just, he hasn't even retired yet. He's supporting his family. He has his first grandchild on the way. His next door neighbor in Three Rivers is that 24-year-old girl you see lying on the bathroom floor. And she's a young woman who struggles with an opiate use disorder, but she's been doing really well. She's, you know, she's about six weeks sober. She had gone to treatment. She's trying to go to meetings most days. She just got a job. She actually is working at Dunkin' Donuts. She's kind of excited about that. But that morning when her mom walk, knocks on that bathroom door and there's no response and the door is locked, the mom, she's gone through this before, and she freaks out and she kicks the door down and finds her daughter, also blue, lying on the ground, not breathing. She calls 911 first, and then she administers um, Narcan to her daughter because she holds naloxone, the overdose reversal drug, on her purse. The first dose of Narcan doesn't revive her at all, but the Palmer cops have already arrived, and every patrol car in Massachusetts carries Narcan, um, and they administer everything they have in the patrol car, but she still doesn't come to, and when EMS arrives, they empty out their kit. Five doses of Narcan later, she comes to. She's actually brought to the Wing Memorial Emergency Room, and what's offered to her? Well, she's gotten her Narcan already, so they did do that, and that was a great guess, because she may collapse again, and that's the one thing they could do to save her life, so that is awesome. I don't know how old you are, but you just got an A from me. What else was offered to her? Crisis eval, okay. So I have to say, nobody in the ER thinks she's suicidal. Um, she denies suicidality, and in fact, without saying I'm suicidal, they're probably not gonna have crisis come. But it's a great thought, it's a great idea that somebody with a mental health training will come evaluate her. That's an awesome concept, right? Anybody ever had this happen to them, show up in the ER after an overdose? Say it again. Yeah, that is a great, that is a high functioning ER too, right? So here she is, she's acute vomiting and diarrhea, her dopamine's 45, she's miserable, she's wicked sick. Here's a piece of paper with 14,000 numbers on it and we need you to call every 15 minutes for the next 48 hours to find a place to go, right? You guys are lovely and hopeful and I actually hope that the wing is actually doing at least that minimum. The truth is, in most emergency rooms, she's treated really badly, and she's basically shipped to the curb. That's the way it runs in most emergency rooms throughout our great state of Massachusetts, but also certainly throughout the country. But I want to tell you a little bit more about my 68-year-old guy um, up there in that picture, right? I didn't tell you his full story. 68 years old, but both of his parents had significant cardiovascular disease. His dad died of a heart attack at the age of 57. His mom died of a stroke at the age of 68. He smokes a pack and a half a day. He kicks back a 12-pack of beer every um, day. He goes to McDonald's three times a week, and I already told you I didn't know him because he never ever showed up for his primary care visit, although I had been told by his wife who I take care of that he had uncontrolled blood pressure when he was checked at a, a work screening. Um, does this guy have addiction? What's he addicted to? Maybe alcohol, yeah, 12 pack every day for many years. He probably is having some trouble with alcohol. He's addicted to nicotine, right? Pack and a half a day, it's a lot. He's probably addicted to fat and sugar, right? He goes to McDonald's that much. I mean, there's no food at McDonald's that's good for us. I think most of us can acknowledge that. He's terrible genetic risk. Did this guy create his heart attack? Oh yeah, he absolutely did. I'm not, I'm not letting this guy off the hook. He's 68 years old. He has a terrible genetic profile, and he actually um, participates in the two of the three highest risk behaviors in our country, smoking and drinking in excess. So that is a real problem, but did anybody roll into his emergency room uh, or into his living room and wag their finger and say, you know what, you created this heart attack. I have no interest in providing any care to you because you clearly have an, you're an addict, right? You're addicted to fat and you're addicted to sugar and you're addicted to nicotine. So I actually have no interest in spending a quarter million dollars trying to save your life. Thanks, I'm gonna just leave you in your living room and you're gonna die in the next 47 minutes, right? Nobody did that, right? Nobody in this entire country would have done that, right? We would have been sued left and right, it would have been unethical, it would be wrong a thousand ways over. Every day I take care of people who are making not great health decisions, because who in this room is perfect, right? Who are my marathon running vegans in this room? Show, show me your hands, you're probably that, Scott. Do you do that? Okay. 
Most of us, right? Like, I drove here, I ate Fritos and a Diet Coke. That's how my night rolled, right? Am I perfect? I am so far from perfect. My point is, is that many of us make health decisions that aren't great, that might actually, actually cause us to have some disease states that aren't ideal. I think a lot of us can acknowledge that. Type 2 diabetes is a perfect example of that. Um, and what, the reason I do this work, the reason I'm not home with my kids tonight and I'm with you guys tonight, is I find that this disparity in care, the care that we provide without any hesitation to an individual who struggles with a disease that we think is a real disease as opposed to the addicts of the world, the fact that these two individuals, an older man and a young woman with her entire life ahead of her, got completely different kind of care, I find that outrageous. It makes me sick. It really does. And if we want to spread it equally and start shaming and blaming every one of us for the terrible health decisions we make every day, then fine. You know what? We would save a lot of money on health care because we would just all die earlier and nobody would get any care. Otherwise, we need to start treating people fairly and equally for the diseases they have. One of the suggestions I'm going to have for you as grassroots people in the room is the next time you see your primary care doctor, I want you to ask them, tell me what you're doing to help people with addiction. Just ask them that question. It's a very reasonable question. When you add in cigarettes, like 30% of this country struggles with addiction. 13% of us struggle with alcoholism, right? And it would be really nice to know that your primary care doctor who you love is actually somewhere fighting this battle. Because you know who we need on the front lines? Everybody. I need every nurse. I need every primary care doctor. I need people doing their damn jobs, right? Because this, this is a problem in your community. I know that. It's a problem in my community. Okay, so let's go back to dopamine. I know I just went off course, but this is the way it rolls. The dopamine story I didn't make up. These are PET scans looking at brains, and that middle column is a healthy brain of people not struggling with addiction. And what you see there is there's lots of orange on that PET scan. That's active dopamine, okay? And when you look at the column that's over to the um, right, those are brains of people struggling with addiction. And that top brain is somebody struggling with cocaine use. The next one is methamphetamine. The third one down is alcohol. And the final one down is um, heroin. And I like this slide because it, again, demonstrates the absence of dopamine in this brain. It's not zero, but it's not so good. I like this slide because I want you to look at the brain of the third one down of somebody with alcohol use disorder. There's still a remarkable amount of dopamine in that. Those of us who struggle with, with alcohol use disorder, which is one of the most problematic drugs in our society, alcohol, and for those of us who have family members or ourselves have struggled with alcohol, we can acknowledge that. The wheels come off the alcohol bus pretty late in the game. It takes, you're a functional alcoholic for a pretty long time before your husband walks out of you and you get your second do OUI and you lose your job, right? It takes a while before things really fall apart. And it's partly because the dopamine um, is still active and you still are, are sort of scraping by on the planet. I'm not arguing for alcohol as a choice, but I'm, I'm acknowledging that it's one of these unspoken thin things in our society. The harm of alcohol on us is enormous. So there are three things that will predispose any one of us to addiction. The first one is genetics. The second one is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is um, growing up in a household with a lot of abuse or trauma. Having poor mental health does not create addiction, right? You can have anxiety or depression, and it doesn't make you somebody who's necessarily predisposed to addiction. But having poor mental health is a subcomponent of these other things. And if you can imagine being you know, a 15-year-old kid who has tremendous social anxiety and never finds that they feel like they fit in and they can't talk at parties and they've never spoken to a girl, and then they have their first three drinks and they realize they're the life of the party, you have somebody who has anxiety or social anxiety who exposes their brain early while it's developing. So it wasn't the anxiety that created it, it's the fact that they exposed their brain and had early exposure. That's a very common thing. There's a lot of self-medication that happens um, during our adolescence. Adolescence is a tricky time of our lives. So the genetics of addiction are extremely strong. It is hard to find any disease that has the genetics that addiction has. If you have a parent or a grandparent with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing addiction yourself. So who needed to hear that? Your kids, actually. Your kids need to understand what their genetic risk is of addiction. And that seems terrifying, I think, to people, except I have to take care of kids. I'm a family doctor. And 
you know, I'll walk into a room with a 15-year-old and they're telling me about their great aunt who had colon cancer and I'm thinking to myself, that's never going to be your problem, right? It may be your problem, but it has nothing to do with your great aunt, right? We spend a lot of time on the genetics of cancer. Actually, the genetics, most cancers are not genetic. They happen to arise from nothing. There are some exceptions to that rule. But with certain mental health disorders, including ADHD or depression or bipolar disease, and very much addiction, the genetics can be enormous. And our kids don't get to change their genetics, right? They get what they get. So you may think it's a bad idea to tell them because they don't get to change it, but guess what? They actually do. I'm gonna tell you about this next thing, that if your kids make the right choices, they get to almost entirely erase their genetics, and you never, ever get to do that. But with addiction, you do. Because all addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. All addiction starts while the brain is developing. So if you can get to the age of 24, 25, and not have used an addictive substance, you've never smoked, you really have never had anything to drink, you've never used marijuana, you will have scooted yourself through the developing brain part of your life, and you will never develop addiction. So when I sat down with my own three kids and explained to them that genetically they are at high risk of developing addiction, which is something I have done, I didn't go into the gory details. I didn't tell them all the who's and what's and where's and how bad it was. I just told them that was their genetic um, background. I said to them, the one thing you guys can do is delay your use. I don't want you ever to smoke cigarettes. I think cigarettes are disgusting and horrible, but most teenagers think that too. But delaying your use of alcohol consumption and marijuana is the only thing you get to do to protect your brains. And if you can scoot through until your brain is nearly done developing, the genetic risk almost entirely disappears. That is why you tell your kids, is because they actually get to control this part of it. Right? And when you teach your kids the facts, you don't scare them. You don't say, you know, it's not the frying egg in the pan. Don't do drugs. You know, you know like this is your brain on drugs. I believe in teaching everybody, adults and teenagers and, and younger people, what we understand about brain development and brain chemistry. We're going to spend a lot of time on marijuana tonight, in fact. Um, so when you talk to somebody who struggles or has struggled with addiction, I always ask the question, tell me about your first substance and how old were you? Was it cigarettes, marijuana, or alcohol? I always take those because they're, I think they're the most commonly first drug out, okay? And the average age of first use is probably what the slide says. The average age of first use that people say is, I was 12, 13, or 14. That's what most people say to me. I've given this talk actually at the correctional um, facilities um, in our area. So in the room I might have 150 people who have been incarcerated, all of whom have been incarcerated due to their disease of addiction. In that room I will say, who was 12 when they first started their first addictive substance? Every hand is in the air. And then I start counting backwards, 11, 10, 9. I have hands in the air at the age of 6. And that seems unimaginable, right, because that's a first grader. But when you grow up in a household where your dad is passed out in an armchair every night with a handle of vodka next to them, and that's your normal, it's actually really easy to access drugs. And it's really easy to access alcohol. And when I ask people who started smoking, I don't know, marijuana at the age of nine, I, I always follow it up with, remind me again, how did you get that? It's usually a family member, right? Sometimes it's a parent or an older sibling who started them on it, who thought it would be fun, right, to get high with their nine-year-old nephew. So if you are 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two drinks a week, right? Not much, guys, two drinks a week at the age of 15. 40% of those 15-year-olds go on to be alcoholics. If you wait until the age of 21, 7% go on to be alcoholics. So again, the national rates of alcoholism at this stage is 13%. It's one of the highest numbers we've ever seen. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but that is what delaying use does, right? All I say to my kids, and what I say to not just my biologic kids, but the kids I take care of in my clinic every day, is I say, I'm asking you to delay, to delay your use. I'm not telling you that marijuana is going to kill you someday. I'm telling you, you've got to wait till your brain is fully developed because marijuana has a really bad impact on the developing brain. So the truth is about our generation of students, the kids in this room under the age of 23, is that they are actually making the best decisions we have seen in 40 years when it comes to substances. Most of us should be patting our teenagers on the back every day for making amazing decisions because we have never seen lower rates of alcohol consumption. We have never seen lower rates of cigarette use. Thank God for that one. Um, and actually, the rates of illicit drugs are pretty flat. So as the sense, so can I ask you guys, you guys are students here, is that fair to say? What do you think of cigarettes? Are you guys, are you smokers? Are you planning on smoking? No? What do you think about cigarettes? 
Oh, okay. Well, I'm not trying to point you out, but I mean, but what do you what do you think about cigarettes in general? Yeah, they're gross, right? This is the response. This is the normal response that you will get from the average teenagers. They'll say they're disgusting. They're gross. They, I ask, I ask teenagers and they're like, they're horrible. They give you wrinkles, they make you older. They give you bladder cancer. I'm thinking, how did that 13 year old know about bladder cancer? That's true and that's pretty impressive she knew that. So as the sense of harm with cigarettes has gone up, use has gone down. The problem is the sense of harm with marijuana is really low, okay? So what do the average people under the age of 25 say to you or what do you think they might know about marijuana? What do you hear? Yes. Ah, oh, yes, I actually, I hear that one all the time. It cures things, it cured my dad's cancer. It's medicine, it helps me sleep, it helps my anxiety. So it has a medical purpose, you hear that. What else do you hear? It's not, I'm not gonna get addicted, it's not a problem. What else? Okay, it's natural, it grows in the ground, it's organic, and it's legal. So of everything that just got stated, the only one so far that's been true is it is legal, right? Everything else I'm gonna teach you about that they're not true. What other things might you do? Here. Yeah. It is better than alcohol. That is said 100% of the time. I hear that all the time. I might be in an auditorium filled with ninth through 12th graders and I hear that all the time. It's always in comparison to alcohol, absolutely. Um, teenagers will tell me it helps them it helps them in school, it helps them study better, it helps them drive, and it helps them on the athletic field. That one cracks me up because I don't know of any sport where having a slow response time is helpful. And I keep thinking about it, like what sport? Like Tai Chi, right? I, that's the only thing I can think of and there's no Tai Chi sport, but anyway, you hear this stuff. So we're gonna dive in for a while on marijuana because I think the public knowledge about marijuana is pretty low, so we're gonna talk about it. So, there are three things that happen between the ages of 12 and 24. They are happening every single day in this middle school and they're happening every single day in the Monson High School. Three things. The first one is called synaptic refinement. So there are tens of billions of little connections in the brain. And that is good for a while when you're a tiny little developing toddler, but by the time you hit adolescence, you need to start cleaning up that tangled mess of a brain. And there are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synaptic connections a second, right? Because that's what you're supposed to be doing. You need to clean up this brain, you need to make it nice and orderly, you need to get rid of the stuff that's not necessary, and you need to hold on to the synaptic connections that are gonna help you in life. And while your kid is losing 30,000 synaptic connections a second, you know, what do you want them to be doing, right? You want them to be doing some mindfulness-based meditation. You want them to be doing art in school. You want them to be studying history. You want them to be on the athletic field. You don't want them like watching a video game and smoking, you know, a joint in the basement because I could tell you the impact of what happens with marijuana, we're gonna understand what happens precisely. The second thing that happens during this time is something called myelination or ensheathing or insulating rapid pathways in the brain. It's about making a brain that is efficient. That is what happens between 12 and 24 and it never happens any other time. And guess what, for those of us over 24, after 24 your brain does absolutely nothing but atrophy. <gasps> Isn't that sad? But it's a fact, and that's okay, right? But I tell you, 12 to 24, these kids' brains are spectacular, doing amazing things. And even though I love my three teenagers at home, they make me crazy, because these amazing brains I'm talking about are all about pushing the limits, right? Their brains are trying to really sort out what gets to stay and what gets to go. And in order to do that, you do a lot of extreme things. You have a lot less, um, thinking about planning for the future, there's a lot of impulsive decision making, more risky behavior, less than optimal planning, less consideration for negative consequences, emotions are felt incredibly strongly. You know, like I said, my poor 15 year old, if she ever sees me talk, um, I have three teenagers and my 15 year old, I can walk in her room and she can say, mom, I love you, you're great. And seven seconds later, she is screaming at me and crying and I literally have not said a word, right? So the emotional valence of our teenagers is really wide. There is never a time in your life when you're more influenced by your peers, ever. And I want you to pause with me on that. When you were in second grade and you were seven years old and one of your friends said, let's go do the stupid thing on the playground, you were like, I'm gonna go tell the teacher, that seems like a bad idea. And when you're 27 and one of your friends says, let's go do this stupid thing, you're like, dude, you're an idiot, 
I'm not gonna do that, right? But when you're 15 or 16 or 17, you're like, awesome, I'm in, right? Because that is what your brain wants to do. Your brain in adolescent is at all about finding its peers. You're trying to find your herd. And that makes sense in terms of evolution. You've already been forced out of your family unit and you're kind of surviving on your own by adolescence in most m mammalian creatures. And you've got to find your people. And it's why your kids' friends really matter. It's why it really matters that you know your kids' friends. It's why when my daughter wanted to spend the night at somebody's house, I'm like, I don't know those parents, so you're gonna give me their number and I'm gonna call them first. And she was embarrassed. She was like, nobody does that. I'm like, uh, I actually think everybody does that, and if they're not, they should, so just give me the number so I can talk to the parents, please, right? That's what we do because we're loving adults who care about our kids. And I don't know everybody, and neither do you guys, right? And I had a lovely conversation with that mom who was delighted that I called, of course. So the third thing that happens during this time between 12 and 24, besides synaptic refinement and myelination, is we actually lay down receptors. We lay down dopamine receptors in the outer cortex of the brain, right? So that's why all addiction is an adolescent developmental disease, is you guys know what happens to dopamine. And if you're desperately during the stage trying to lay down dopamine and you're adding in drugs that disrupt dopamine the whole time, that's how it all starts. The second receptor that is impacted is something called anandamide. And anandamide is a relatively newly understood um, uh, chemical in the brain. It is a naturally occurring endocannabinoid. This chemical, we think, is partly in charge of deciding what comes and what goes. And the problem with anandamide is it is a mirror image of the chemical called THC, which is the psychoactive cannabinoid in marijuana. And your brain is unable to tell them apart. It can't see the difference between THC and your naturally occurring anandamide. And in fact, THC is more potent. And it boots the naturally occurring one that's helping to make good decisions about what stays and goes. It boots it out of the way. So it's like using a sledgehammer to help determine what gets to stay in your brain versus using a scalpel. This is the reason why marijuana is a neurotoxic drug to the developing brain. I don't care what you do after the age of 25. I don't care at all. You stay in your own house, oh, you're a great man, Scott, thank you. You stay in your own house after the age of 25 and use marijuana and you don't get on the roads, you don't operate on my knee, you don't babysit my kids, you don't change the lug nut on my tires, I don't care. I don't care what you do when you're high in your own house. And I don't think that marijuana is any worse than alcohol after the age of 25. But I think alcohol is bad while the brain is developing too, don't get me wrong. So the lesson that I'm trying to help you guys understand is that while your brain is developing, marijuana is a neurotoxic drug, and we know this very specifically. So let's talk a little bit more about what some of the studies have shown us, that marijuana use during teenage years affects attention, verbal learning, memory, processing speed. Even when you're not high, that stays. When you compare two groups of people, and I'm gonna spend a minute on this slide because this one's important. When you look at kids between the ages of 15 and 21, and you compare a group of teenagers, 15 to 21, who used marijuana zero times, to a group of teenagers who used marijuana 400 times or more, which, by the way, is not that much use, because that means you're just using every other day for that period of six years. It doesn't take much to get to 400 uses or more. When I compare those two categories on this chart, because I'm gonna do the extremes because it's easier to see. The kids who used marijuana zero times by age 25 had graduated from college 36% of the time. The kids who had used marijuana 400 times or more graduated from college by 25, 2% of the time. When you look at unemployment rates by age 25, unemployment for zero use is 21%. Unemployment for 400 times use or more was 52%. This is a study that comes out of New Zealand, so it's a much bigger welfare state, so they actually look at dependent on, on, on welfare. So the use of being dependent on welfare by age 25 is 25% for those with zero use, and it's 57% for 400 use or more. That for me is a kid who didn't leave my house, right? That is a failure to launch. I love my three kids, I want them to grow up and leave my house. I want them to pay taxes, I want them to be citizens of the world. I don't want them living in my basement because they have couch lock from having used marijuana as teenagers. It is a real problem, I'm telling you. As a public health concern of mine, this is an economic um, devastation, actually. For Massachusetts, which has the best schools in the entire country, we have ranked as the number one state of schools in the entire country, and now we're legalizing marijuana, this is not going to be a benefit to our kids and our futures. For those of us who are going to be in a nursing home someday who really do need operations on our knee. So um, 
Eight point drop in IQ by age 35 when you stop mari start marijuana into the teenage years. But the problem with everything I just showed you is actually I think a lot of it isn't even true because all of it was based on the old marijuana. Marijuana that was 3% THC or less. Because in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, all marijuana was THC 3% or less. These days, you cannot find a field-grown marijuana plant that is any less than about 10% THC. And most plants being grown out there are 10 to 16% THC. And again, THC is the psychoactive one that mirrors anandamide. It's the one that is disrupting brain development. So we have a plant that is much more potent, and that is what is being grown everywhere. The second thing is that most of our kids don't think about marijuana as a fat rolled joint. They think about marijuana in this form, and these are the concentrates. Shatter, um, earwax, butter. I mean, if I found this in my kid's room, I would pick it up with a Kleenex and be like, Bleh, that's disgusting, right? This stuff is between 70 and 90% THC. So the data I just showed you about what happens to brain development is based on something that isn't that potent. Do you think brains are getting better exposed to 70% THC? You think we're making a generation of geniuses out there that are really going to be able to perform well and function in society long term? This is not a positive turn of events for our society. I think a lot of you guys know there's lots of ways to get marijuana into your system. You can smoke it, you can vape it, you can eat it, you can eat it in spaghetti sauce and beer and milk, you can rub it on your skin as a cream, you can use it as a tincture under your um, tongue. There's lots of ways to get this stuff. Um, what is coming to a store near you, I can't remember, what did Monson do with stores? Do you guys, did you guys, first of all, does, how did you vote? How did Monson vote in the November ballot? Yes, so you are a town that would have to have a town-wide referendum to turn off a, dis a, a, a store, a recreational marijuana store, and that has not happened, because you guys would know that if you had had a town-wide referendum. You have not, so you are a town that will have pot stores, period, right, unless you choose not to do that, in which case it's a town vote. It's complicated how it even happens. Um, so you will be having a marijuana store near you and they will have these products sold because at this mo the moment the Cannabis Commission has not decided how it's going to regulate this, uh, what exactly can be sold. But I can tell you that the ballot measure that was passed in November of 2016 was the most wide open, um, you can do anything you want, written by the marijuana industry ballot that we have ever seen. It went way beyond what Colorado did. Has no limits on the amount of THC that can be sold. It was very specific that edibles must be available. So when, you, when you're an industry that, that sells an addictive product, your job in order to survive is to addict as many people as possible, right? Who, who needs an MBA to say that? That's your goal. And if I'm telling you that all addiction starts while the brain is developing, the industry that the marijuana uh, billionaires are working on involves addicting as many of these young people as possible. That has to happen for them to survive, right? That's, the, how, that's how they figure it out. So when you add marijuana to sugar and fat and candy, and you think this stuff is not targeting our kids, you think little old ladies with, with cancer and, and they can't stop vomiting because of their chemotherapy are eating gummy bears, right? They're not doing that. That's not what we're providing when I do medical certification of marijuana to sick adults. This stuff is targeting our kids. Those candy bars up there have 12 servings of marijuana. The THC concentrates in there is between 70 and 90%. This is stuff that comes out of the Colorado stores. I have handled it, I have read the back. It is almost unimaginably difficult to understand, but the last time anybody in this room shared a Kit Kat with 11 other people was never in your life, right? 12 servings of high potency marijuana in every candy bar. This is not a positive thing. Um, and this is what bothers me the most, is that we, as a nation, have made some great moves to limit smoking. And I know I have smokers in the room, and I'm not throwing you under the bus. I would love to help you stop smoking. Um, but we know that smoking is the number one killer in our country, by a long shot. But the truth is, fewer and fewer people smoke. You know, when you look at the statistics on our teenagers, they are really unlikely to smoke. And if we had stayed on the trajectory of the President Obama Healthcare Administration, 
The prediction was by the year 2025, smoking in this country would have been close to 0%, right? So here we are, we've tackled this massive public health crisis of cigarette smoking, and we chose to replace it with marijuana. We chose to give the tobacco industry this new industry called the marijuana industry. And it makes me so frustrated because you would have thought we learned our lessons. In the year 1900, tobacco existed. Of course it existed. It's a native plant of North America. But the native people of North America were not smoking two packs a day. They used it ritually. They used it infrequently. The plant itself was not even that potent. But starting in 1900, the industry took over. And the first thing they did is they be began to plant more potent plants with thicker veins. It is the vein of the tobacco leaf that contains the nicotine. Right? I just told you, that's what we've been doing for the last decade with marijuana. So it's the first shift. You make a more potent plant. And then you start combining it with more addictive substances, sugar, fat, other things. And in cigarettes case, you combine it with lots of other addictive substances. You roll it up into a little piece of paper and make it quite affordable. In the year 1900, less than 1% 1 of Americans smoke cigarettes. By the year 1950, 70% of American men were smoking cigarettes. We have gone through this before and I feel like we just somehow did not learn our lesson. So I tell you, if everybody in the state knew what you knew now, I do not believe that we would have passed marijuana. Because again, what somebody does over the age of 25, I don't really care. I can't have them driving. I can't have them putting other people in harm's way. But what we know is this industry is going to be targeting our kids, and that is who is going to be smoking or imbibing marijuana one way or another. OK. <gasps> Let's talk about alcohol. So in this country, one third of us drink zero alcohol, absolutely none. One third of us drink just a little bit, a couple drinks a week, a couple drinks a month, very, very light social drinkers. And the final one third of us in this country drink everything else, everything else, okay? And in fact, the final 10% of us drink on average nine to 10 drinks a day. Now, I make an argument that most of those people probably are not here tonight because they already started, right? You can't be at a talk tonight and get your 10 drinks in by now, probably. So let's talk about what a drink is because every day I talk to patients. Today I did, I don't know, 15 physicals. and Always during my physicals I say, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And women, more than any other category these days, say to me, oh, you know, I have a couple drinks at night. And I'm like, oh, yeah? Yeah, what are you drinking? And they're like, you know, I have a couple drinks of wine. And I say, what's in your wine glass? And they're like, you know, a wine glass. So this is what a drink is. It's a 12-ounce regular beer. It's not what I drink, which is a high, you know, like some locally brewed, hoppy, 8.2% alcoholic beverages, which, by the way, is usually a 16-ounce. So if I have a beer, it actually is about one5 or 1.75 equivalents, okay? A glass of wine is five ounces of wine. So when I, my women say, I have a couple glasses at night, I say, I just need you to put five ounces in your wine glass and acknowledge that is one glass, okay? Just acknowledge the truth. That's all, no shame, no blame. But if you, what you find is really you're pouring yourself 10 to 15 ounces every night and you have a couple of those, then you just got yourself to six drinks every single night, right? And I need you to pause and acknowledge that truth and know that that's really not healthy. By anybody's measure, this is not a healthy consumption of alcohol. And I talk about women and alcohol consumption because we have never seen a shift as rapidly demographically in terms of public health as we have with alcohol and women. In the last 15 to 20 years, more and more women have become alcoholics. And it's partly this culture. It's like, you know, mommy's time out, mommy juice. And guess what? You know what? I'm looking at my women in this room, and I'm sorry to exclude the men, but being a wor working woman these days really is really hard. I don't know who was up at 5 this morning and was tackling breakfast dishes and making lunches and scooting kids out the door and then has an 8 to 12 hour work day. And I don't know how many of you women in this room are going to go home and make dinner and clean the kitchen and do laundry and yell at a few people, but that's what my life is like, and I accept every other woman's life is like this in the room. And it becomes very normal behavior to walk into the house and think, in order to transition from my work life to this life, I need to start drinking, right? It becomes very normal behavior. It's very unusual for women not to go out with their girlfriends and not drink. It's very normal. It's, it's become very accepted, hugely accepted. And the problem is women do not process alcohol well. And these days, I now run a, a drug and alcohol treatment center, and I have 24-year-old women who are active, severe alcoholics who are 
picking bugs off the wall. They are having active seizures. I didn't think it was possible physiologically, but that is my new normal. About half the people we admit for alcohol use disorder are women and they're young. So um, the reason I spend time on this is because I actually think a lot of us as adults have developed an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. And the message you send to your kids when you walk into the house after a terrible day at work, and the first thing your kid sees you do is to pop off the top of a six pack or to open up a, a, a bottle of wine, is that when you're stressed out, when you're overwhelmed, the best thing to do is to drink. And if many more of us walked in the house after a terrible day at work and said, man, I've had a hard day. I'm going to go bring the dog for a walk. Does anybody want to come with me? I'm going to go sit down with my iPhone, and I'm going to put on a John Kabat-Zinn 10-minute meditation, and I'm going to go sit on the couch, and I'm going to try to calm myself down. Anybody in with me on that? What if a lot of us modeled really healthy behaviors of managing stress? Right? You think your kids are not watching every move you make, they're watching every move you make, including your little kids. They know exactly what you're doing. When you yell at your kids for being on their iPhones all the time, which I do all the time, guess who's on their iPhones all the time? Right? It's hard. So um, this is me chiding you as an adult who has found herself developing an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. I am very conscious of how I drink now. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the point that she's making is that we are told, actually by our doctors all the time now, that alcohol is healthy for you, it's good, it prevents heart attacks. Well, let's be clear. The big studies on whether alcohol was healthy for you or not was funded by the alcohol industry, okay? So what is a healthy consumption of alcohol in the better ones run studies? It's probably an ounce or two a day or less. And the problem is that it's very fast. Nobody drinks an ounce of wine. Nobody drinks an ounce of wine. That is this much wine. You would be wasting a bottle all the time, right? And so to go from what we think maybe have some health benefits to having too much alcohol happens very fast. And the downsides of too much alcohol are huge. It's the third leading cause of death in our country. So I don't tell people that alcohol is healthy for them. I say water is healthy for them. I say alcohol is actually not that good for you. We actually have more and more evidence that it's a cancer-causing drug. So I don't promote it anymore. I say get a lot of exercise, get a good quality sleep, eat good quality food, lots of vegetables. I spend most of my time taking people off their meds and trying to change lifestyle. Okay, there's three things that lead people to develop addiction. It was so long ago that I said those words to you that you probably forgot the first two. The first one was genetics. The second one was early exposure while your brain is developing. And the third one is actually something called an ACE score, or growing up in a household that caused trauma. I'm not going to actually go into great huge detail on this, because I have um, some younger people in the room, but I am going to say a little bit about it, because I think this is really important. So the ACE study came out in 1996, and it was a study done in Kaiser in California in San Diego County that asked adults 10 questions about what might have happened to them in their house growing up. And um, then it compared those 17,000 people to 50,000 Kaiser patients with chronic disease. So it's tiny, and Scott's going to get you the slide deck so you can read it. And actually, one late night when you have nothing better to do, I want you to Google ACE scores. So 10 questions, and I'm not going to read every question, but the questions run something like this. Was there somebody in your household who uh, was, had major mental illness? Was there somebody in your household who was incarcerated? Did you feel like your family didn't love you or protect you? Did you feel like your parents were too drunk or too high to take you to the doctor? if you were sick? Were you ever physically abused? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you ever watch your mom, specifically the woman, or your stepmom um, be physically abused by the father? Were your parents separated or divorced? 10 questions, pretty straightforward, but pretty upsetting questions, actually. What the study showed is that 54% of Americans score at least a one. That's not a surprise because divorce is on that. And divorce is a little less than 50% now. I score a one on an A score. My parents were divorced when I was 13. But I don't score anything else on an A score because I grew up in a magical life. I had everything, everything that I could have ever wanted in terms of love and support was there for me. But when you look at the rates of um, the scores that Americans have, this is a measure of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. If you score a six or a higher on an ACE score, you're going to die 20 years earlier. 
If you score a four or a higher on an ACE score, you're going to have a heart attack 20 years earlier. You're going to have asthma. You're going to have emphysema. You're going to have multiple broken bones. You're going to have 30 or more sexual partners. Crazy things are predicted from growing up in a household that was neglectful, abusive, and traumatic. And it doesn't make sense when you first hear that because you're thinking to yourself, why would that impact asthma, right? Except I want you to pause and think about this because from an evolutionary standpoint, your fight or flight response, that fear response that we all have that protects us when we're being chased by a bear, that should be on for 20 minutes while you're running and going to a cave and sheltering down and then it shuts down. But when you are a seven-year-old kid growing up in a household where you're afraid of coming home to find your mom overdosed in the bathroom, when you're worried about your older brother coming into your bedroom at night, when you're worried about whether there's going to be enough food to feed you tomorrow, you are a child who has a cortisol sympathetic fight or, fight or flight response on 24 hours a day for years on end. And that toxic brain environment has an impact on every organ that develops in your body. And if there's one thing that we can do as a generation and as people is to help protect our kids, it's what teachers do, it's what law enforcement does, it's what guidance counselors do and school nurses every single day. You know who knows ACE scores? School nurses know the ACE scores of every kid in their school, right? They, they actually know, they don't know it all, but they know a lot of them, right? Lots of people do. Your school resource officer in the school, they know what's going on. When you are somebody who who has had a terrible childhood. There's no faster way to run from it to numb up with alcohol and drugs. So having a high ACE score is a huge predictor of who's gonna struggle with addiction. And one of the things I say to my patients, because I actually, I do an ACE score with my patients all the time, and they'll hand it back to me and they'll be sitting there weeping with a score of a seven and they've never told anybody about it, right? And we sit together, we talk about it. And they don't get to change their past. Our kids don't get to change their ACE scores, sadly, but they can create themselves the next generation with lower ACE scores, right? That's the goal here. So knowing about ACE scores and trauma, I actually think is a really important thing for society. I think it's really important for schools. Again, I grew up locally. I grew up in the North Quabbin area of Athol and Orange. Um, and the ACE scores in that region are really high, right? These are shut down mill towns, but guess what it looks like? It looks just like it looks here. I would predict the ACE scores as a community of this community are really high. I don't know if anybody would agree or disagree with me on that, but I think statistically we can say it. Okay, three things, genetics, trauma, and early exposure while the brain is developing. And my message to the adults in this room is to talk to your kids. A kindergartner should know that if they find a pill on the ground, they should never pick it up, they should get an adult. Because a five milligram high blood pressure medicine like lisinopril will kill them. Okay, that's a message that a five-year-old should hear. When should you start talking to your kids about drugs and alcohol? I don't know, fourth or fifth grade. If I tell you that the first age of use is a 10, 12, 13, or 14, your horse is way out of the barn by the time you talk to your ninth graders, guys. So this is a conversation about talk early, talk often, model for your kids, kids healthy behaviors. If you're drinking every single night, I want you to think about that, and I think that um, you might want to drink a little bit less. Um, and the message I say to my own kids is delay your use as long as possible. So again, our kids are making fabulous decisions. Less alcohol. This is data that goes back to 19, the 1990s, but we've been collecting data on our kids nationwide since the 70s. Um, so lower alcohol rates, lower cigarette use, uh, drugs, in, uh, illicit drugs tend to be pretty flat. The exception is e-cigarettes and vaping. Do you guys think you have a vaping problem in Monson? Does anybody know? Are you guys finding vape pens in the school? Do you know that? Yeah. So this is the problem with vaping, is that there's a sense that it's all fine and benign. It's just a watermelon flavored pen. It's all good. You can buy them online. No big deal. The problem is these things are all manufactured in China and India. They're largely unregulated. And the truth is we have no idea what's in those cartridges. We really don't. And when we test them, we often find nicotine, right? So here you are thinking you're vaping watermelon, but actually you're developing a nicotine addiction, which is the worst thing to do, because I just told you nicotine rates are going way down, right? And the other thing is that our kids who are vaping in school, we have no idea what they're vaping. They're actually vaping cannabinoid oils, right? You're vaping something into your beautiful pink lungs that's formaldehyde. We don't want that to happen. So I actually find vape rates in communities that are more socioeconomically depressed tend to be fairly low because they're kind of expensive. I was speaking actually in sort of a rich suburb of Boston last night, and their vape rates are wicked high. 
and their parents actually buy vape pens for them because they think somehow there's some benefit to it. I wish they were all outlawed. There's no benefit to a vapor as far as I'm concerned. And if I were the goddess of the world, I'd get rid of them all. Okay, I am gonna talk for one slide about um, what I think is a problem that many of us have in this room. Um, it's the hardest thing I do as a parent, which is parenting the I generation. So the generation right now of age maybe eight to 18 is maybe will be called the I generation. It's gonna be the first generation that has had an iPhone or smart device in their hands all the time. Um, and I don't know who has struggled with this as a parent in this room. Anybody ever had trouble with their kids and their use of their devices? Ever have a yelling match about how much time is being spent on a device? Isn't it your favorite thing to do ever? It is awful. And it's, you know, it's not the school's fault, although let's be clear, technology is being pushed everywhere. My kids are on computers doing homework all the time. All their assignments are on a computer or a tablet. And I can't, I don't, I can't tell what they're doing. I really can't tell. And this is an article that came out in the Atlantic Monthly just two months ago in September. And the reason you're gonna get this slide deck from Scott is because I want you to go read this article. It's a really good article that looks at this generation and what the I generation is looking like in terms of depression and anxiety and having a really hard time connecting to human beings because so much of their time is connecting through, you know, WhatsApp and, you know, Instagram or whatever it is. And um, I read this article and my husband read this article. We read it at the same time on separate sides of the house and then we came together and freaked out entirely and we basically took the kids' phones away. And it was one of the worst weekends of our lives because nobody was talking to us, as you can imagine. Um, but after, and we didn't take them away permanently, and they do use them during the day, but they, they have to be locked up by, by 9 p.m. That's the rule, right? And I tell you, who knew how much chatter was happening between 9 and, and 7 in the morning? Those phones were going off all night long, and I never knew that. I didn't know. And after a week, when they started talking to us again, my daughter said to me, um, Mom, she didn't apologize for how awful she was. She said, I want to let you know I'm sleeping better, I'm less tired during the day, and I've started to read books again. And I thought, yep. That, and, and so if your kids have their phones at night, you need to put an end to that, right? That's, there's one thing. There, Comcast has a tool, which I have not done yet, but it's, a, it's an app on your phone that actually locks phones off. Like you could set it, I think. Um, so let's pretend in our minds we would say enough screen time is probably no more than two hours a day. Wouldn't it be nice if they shut down? Wouldn't that, I mean, we live in a high tech world. Why doesn't that exist? It does exist. So I don't know who people use as their, um, carrier, but Comcast has an app, um, I have a patient who works for Comcast who told me about this, that could power down the devices and turn them off. You have a lot more parental control. So call your server and start demanding that you get more parental control, because your kids are being exposed to stuff that you have no idea. It's terrifying. The internet has everything on it, and they have access to it all. So this is a great article. Okay, I told you I was going to talk about opiates, and I am now. Um, in the year, in, in every morning, I wake up early, I walk the dog, I drink my coffee, and I read the obituaries. That's my morning routine. And I know that seems creepy that I'm all over the obituaries, but I'm a family doctor and my patients die, and I have multiple people in hospice, and I need to know who died because I have to fill out a death certificate and I need to call the family. And in December of 2012, I read the obituary of the young woman on the top right in the city year jacket, and it said, Ashley Sims, age 21, died of a heroin overdose at home. And I grew up and I work in a place just like this place and I know her grandparents who raised her and I called them to tell them how horrified I was to know that Ashley had died and I called them to thank them for telling the truth about how Ashley had died. Because for years in advance of that, I had been reading obituaries of young people dying unexpectedly at home. And there's no unexpected death at home unless it's a suicide or an overdose. Unless the bottom of the obituary says, please give money to the Dana-Farber or the Lymphoma Leukemia Society, unanticipated young people's deaths, you largely fall in suicide or overdose. So when those grandmothers went to the local paper, they said, don't let Ashley's death go in vain. You need to start telling the story in 2012 about what is happening in our community with opiate addiction. And the Greenfield Recorder, so I live in Franklin County, the little Greenfield Recorder began running front page stories every day for months on end. And I have to say, this little Franklin County has led the state and Massachusetts has led the country in terms of our response to opiate addiction. 
partly because of Ashley's death, and I, I give credit to her grandmoms all the time. So I started getting into this work very deeply at this time. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that pills are absolutely on the hook for starting this epidemic. It's not the killer now, I wanna be clear about that, but there's no doubt it started with overprescribing for the last 20 years of opiate prescriptions. This country prescribes more opiates than any other country by a long shot. Um, it's not that those other countries don't do back surgery and knee surgery. It's not like they don't have pain, but they don't prescribe like we prescribe. And I think everybody in this room has a story they can tell about being prescribed too many pills. Um, when you look at accidental over, I'm sorry, accidental death in the country, op opiate or drug overdose deaths by far outpace motor vehicle accidents, gun violence, and AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. We have now surpassed all of that. And we're losing between 91 and 130 Americans every day to death by opiate overdose. It's a disaster, right? It's a disaster that was brought to you originally by the American medical system, right? It's appalling. I'm gonna correct myself. It was brought by the American medical system, but really the pharmaceutical industry who was making money Okay, so when you watch the country, the red is overdoses in that first top map uh, in the top left is 2003, and you watch the red start to track across our country, and that last map is 2014, which is before we really start to see fentanyl coming in from China. So that map is way more red now. So Massachusetts has never been a heavy prescribing state. So I, I trained, um, I did my training in Massachusetts and Boston, and uh, Massachusetts was rated 40 to 45 in terms of um, uh, number of opiate prescriptions written. For a really long time, that was true. This is not a state with lots of pill mills where there are lots of rogue doctors for cash for pill businesses. It's not the way it worked here. But growing up and during my training, I always knew that I-95 was known as Oxy Highway because the pills were coming up largely from Florida. And there was a whole industry of people sending buses down to Florida from Maine and Western Mass and Kentucky. And it was this pill tourism. And you would get all your time paid for in the hotel and all your meals paid and you would be given $200 cash and all you had to do was to walk into any one of the 600 pill mills and strip malls in Florida. You didn't need a limp, you didn't need a diagnosis, you didn't need to be old. And they would hand you a stack of prescriptions and a bag of pills and then you would get back on your tour bus and you'd hand it to your tour operator who then went and dispensed it all over South Boston and Greenfield and Kentucky and everywhere. So in the year 2009, the federal government looked at the state of Florida and said, you guys have screwed up the entire eastern seaboard and we're going to cut off federal funding if you don't get it under control. And so in 2009 and 2010, the um, DEA shut down nearly every one of those 600 clinics in Florida. 34 doctors are currently incarcerated um, because they weren't actual doctors, they were drug dealers. They may have had MD after their name and they may have gone and trained an American system, but they were dealing drugs. Uh, so the problem is that when you shut down the pipeline of pills and you have people struggling with addiction all over the place, what are you left with, right? You're left with unbelievably pure, cheap, deadly heroin. And the Mexican cartels were distributing heroin well in advance preparing for this. They knew this was gonna happen. It's a very smart system. It's extremely high tech. It involves UPS and FedEx and Lyft and Uber and airplanes. And there's no wall that's gonna be big enough to stop the drugs from coming into our country. It is not, this is not gonna be an easy thing to shut down. It's largely nonviolent. I could text somebody in about four minutes, I could have 50 bags of heroin in our lobby. That's how it rolls. So when you look at the country and you ask emergency medical responders, what's your number one drug of concern, the dark green area, the answer is heroin. But when you look at that map, you're like, well, what's up with the southeast? I just told you I-95, that goes through the southeast. Why don't they have a heroin problem? And the answer is this. Those dark purple states are states where there's still on average between one and 1.5 bottles of opiate per person in that state. These are heavily prescribing states still. Right? So I, I told this to Scott um, when he and I were sharing some information when we walked in. I had knee surgery um, five days ago. And I saw a surgeon who didn't know who I was, right? I chose to go to not my local hospital. I just, I wanted a tiny bit of privacy for once. So I saw a guy who had just moved here from Georgia. 
very, very well-renowned orthopedic surgeon. And he didn't know who I was, and that's fine, I was not offended, but he handed me a prescription for 50 oxycodone, right? 50, five zero. I, I'm 48 years old, I'm really athletic, I'm totally healthy, and I didn't even fill that prescription, right? I, I kept it on my desk and kept staring at it, thinking, are you kidding me? And it reminded me, I have a guy from Georgia who thinks that prescribing 50 of something is actually appropriate, because when you look at the prescribing pattern where he came from, that was normal, right? But now he's in Massachusetts, and next week, I'm gonna be teaching him 18, 15 things in that, in that office visit. Um, so, the problem is that when you look at the country in terms of heroin use, the red and orange states, that's heroin. And if you can imagine in the next three years when the DEA, the FDA, the CDC starts curtailing the prescribing practices of all those providers in those purple states, when you start seeing CVS saying they will no longer fill opiates longer than seven days, CVS fills prescriptions for 26% of our entire country. So when regulations start to shift shift, those purple states will all become red states, right? They will all convert to heroin. And I don't want there to be an overprescription of opiates. That's not good. But I want, to, I want to us to acknowledge the unanticipated consequences of converting to heroin, which is heroin kills people. And what we predict is we think there may be as many as 500,000 deaths in the next three to five years, especially in the southeast from overdose. This problem is not getting better. It's actually going to be getting worse before it gets better. And, it's, and if you think Arkansas and Alabama are building methadone clinics and having Narcan in every patrol car and having it in the school nurse's office, that's not going to be happening. Those are not states known to be spending money on public health measures, right? This is going to be a massive problem. Okay, so how is it that our kids might get exposed to opiates? So first of all, I am going to say that our kids, again, are making awesome decisions. And things have really shifted in the last six years in terms of exposure to prescription drugs. And that is because my hope is that every person in this room has either prescriptions under lock and key in their house or they've gotten rid of them, right? For those of you that had your arthroscopic surgery and got 50 of something, if you don't use it, get it the heck out of your house. It belongs in the police drug take back box. That for me is yesterday's message. I can't believe I even have to say those words anymore. I was saying that in 2012. It's now almost 2018. If you actively have a controlled substance that you use yourself for chronic pain, for anxiety, for something, it should be kept under lock and key. Nothing should be in your medicine cabinets anymore, right? The rule in my house is you don't get to take any medicine without talking to an adult. And I don't say that because I'm a doctor. I'm a mom. And nobody knows the difference in my house between Tylenol and Motrin, right? Because they're teenagers. Most adults don't seem to know the difference between them. So if they have a headache, if they can't sleep, they come talk to one of their parents to say, can I take a Benadryl, mom? Can I use some Tylenol? How much should I take? These medicines should not be kept and managed by your kids. They just shouldn't. They're managed by responsible adults. So if you have anything in your house that you think anybody might want, get it the heck out of your house. That's yesterday's news, but it is the reason our kids are not actively using opiates because their access to them is really low. Thank God for that, right? The truth is our kids get opiates when they're prescribed them. They have an ACL tear because they're a girl soccer player. They get their wisdom teeth out, right? That's when they get exposed. So who, anybody have had a teenager who was giving an opiate prescription recently? And what did you get? What did you get? Twenty-five. And how many, may I ask you, how many did you end up using? Four. Four. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to give credit to where credit's due. I would say that six years ago, the answer would have been everybody was prescribed between 30 and 60. So the numbers have come down. And when we look at the statewide numbers on people, dentists and oral surgeons, they're now in general, on average, prescribing 16. So 25 is a high number for recent. But what your daughter, is it your daughter? What your daughter did is the normal thing, which is when I have asked, I've now asked 20,000 people, how many pills did you use when you had your wisdom teeth out? The answer is always zero, four, or six. Zero, two, four, or six, that's it. I have never once heard anybody using more than six. One day I had a guy in the back of an auditorium who said, I use 60, and I'm thinking to myself, there's an oral surgeon I'm not gonna see. <laughs> and then he said, but I'm an addict, right? So I'm gonna tell you, any of you ready in this room gets a root canal or has their wisdom teeth out? The answer is you needed six or less and that's what you should request. And you know what, if your kid needs more later, call the doctor, they're on call 24 hours a day, they can handle it, okay? The other thing is this is the thing you guys do get to control because you can walk into any pharmacy with a controlled substance and say, 
I don't want my 50 Percocet, right? I really want 10 or fewer. Now the other 40 will get wasted. You don't get to go back tomorrow and get the other 40. They're now disappeared, right? But that's the thing we get to control. That's part of the Charlie Baker's uh, administration changes that happened two years ago. It's a positive move. Um, I have to say, I love my kids. Um, and when I came home from the liquor store, I'm sorry, I keep saying that. When I came home from the hardware store, this is like four or five years ago, and I had a lock, and I drilled it into a cabinet, and I locked up all the alcohol in my house. My kids, particularly my oldest son, was like, Mom, what's up? Do you not trust us? And I was like, no, you're a teenager. Like, why would I have my alcohol out and available to you? Because I know what I did, and I know what my husband did in the 1980s with alcohol, right? Why am I going to make this any easier for you to get access to? So it's under lock and key in my house. I love my kids, and they happen to be pretty good kids, but I go through their rooms. I don't tear them apart, but I walk through their rooms. I do not clean them. I do not do their laundry. I walk in and I'm horrified. I do a lot of yelling at my house, but I look for things that are concerning behavior. If I find any pills or any pill bottles in my kids' room, Tylenol, Benadryl, anything, I am completely freaked out because that's against the rules. I freak out with straws in my kids' rooms. Anything that you could snort something through is a concern to me. I want to be the parent who figured out my kid was struggling about three months in. I do not want to be the parent who figured it out three years in. I will have really missed the boat, right? It's really different to take care of somebody who's struggling with a, um, an addiction after three years than somebody after three months. So this is a slide that you know is from Learn to Cope. This is stuff you might find in a kid's room who is struggling. Little tiny plastic bags and you'll find hundreds or thousands of them. A straight edge razor. Do you think your kid is glazing the windows? You find a straight edge razor in your kid's room, they're either causing self-harm behavior or they're cutting drugs, right? There's no reason for that. Vinegar, bottles of bleach, I can tell you, my kids are not cleaning. Um, parents will say they kept asking me for cotton balls, Q-tips. I don't know the last time you guys bought a box of Q-tips. I think I buy them like once a decade. We don't go through them that fast. But when parents in hindsight reflect upon their 24-year-old who's really in trouble, they will say to me, I wish I had known some of this stuff earlier. Tourniquets, anything, there's a lot of things you can use as a tourniquet these days though. Um, anything that you're using, I tell you, marijuana is the one that causes me the most concern these days because I do think access to it is really high. So I showed you those pictures of shatter and butter, but there's a lot of equipment it takes to vape marijuana. And I will sometimes have parents send me a picture of some complicated several hundred dollars worth of equipment. And I'm like, yeah, that kid is vaping. And that is this really very expensive hand blown way of doing it. If you have somebody in your life that you love that is struggling with any opiate addiction, you need to have Narcan or Naloxone on you, in my opinion. This is a uh, drug reversal agent that anybody in this room can use on anybody else. If you have somebody who's lying on the floor having a seizure and you give them Narcan, will you have caused them any harm? No. no. Would you have helped them? Yes. Not with a seizure. You will have not hurt them, but you probably will not have helped them. And always when you think somebody's down on the ground not breathing, you always call 911 first. But if you have somebody you love, you should have Narcan. It is available to everybody in this room without a prescription at any CVS or Walgreens. And as of a month ago, by state mandate, every pharmacy now in the state must have this in their pharmacy without a prescription. It is covered by your insurance company. So I have two vials of Narcan on me at all the time. One is in my car and one is in my bag. And it's not because I'm a doctor. It's because I'm a human being who interacts with people who may be struggling. People use in lots of crazy public places, right? Cumberland Farms, Dunkin' Donuts, libraries. Those are places where people should be trained as first responders. Your librarians, they should have Narcan. Seriously, Cumberland Farms, any place with a public bathroom, high risk places. Okay, so um, what does it take to get better? I'm at the end here, I'm gonna do two more slides. But I'm gonna say, people get better. You know, I know that I'm, I feel like I'm all low dopamine on you, but actually I am one of the golden retrievers of the planet and people do get better. But it isn't one thing that makes people better, it's a whole host of things that it takes. On everybody's pie of what it takes to get better is the giant piece of sober long-term living. And if you're gonna go back to the same house with the boyfriend that treats you badly and drinks and you're struggling with alcohol, you're never going to make it, right? We need to support sober living in our communities. And if somebody if somebody wants to take over some falling apart house and make it sober living and they're going to run it well, you sure as heck better support them. Because it is the problem we have more than any other problem in our state. Is people come to the treatment centers, they get 30 days, they maybe get to the next level and get 
60 or 90 days, but then they have nowhere to go that is providing them sober living. So we have got to start spending money on that. So the other things that make people better, I'm a big pro believer that medicines can help reduce the cravings. So I use a lot of methadone, a lot of buprenorphine, a lot of um, naltrexone. For alcohol, I use a lot of medicines to reduce cravings. I really try to treat people's trauma issues. I try to get them good mental health care. I try to get them medicines that help support them. People need a sense of purpose. People always ask me, the dopamine got broken in the brain. What makes it better? What builds dopamine? The first thing is time. It takes about two years to get your dopamine back on board. But what builds dopamine in the brain? Having a sense of purpose, doing something, going to school, going to work, loving your dog, volunteering somewhere, shoveling out your elderly neighbor, falling in love, restoring relationships with family members, restoring relationships with your kids. This makes you better. And people get their dopamine back entirely. You know what doesn't make you better? Getting locked up in a cell going to Chicopee as a woman and getting no treatment and getting isolated in a cell and likely being abused. Do you think that, that restores dopamine in your brain? You know all of our people who are getting incarcerated? They're coming out someday. You know who they are? They're your nephew and they're your neighbor. We haven't helped them get better. In fact, oftentimes we've made them a little bit worse. Um, so these are great books on addiction. Every one of them I love. I've read them over the last many years. Has anybody read any of these guys? What was that? Which one? A Beautiful Boy. Oh, Beautiful Boy is a beautiful book, beautifully written about a dad's journey with a son who really struggles. And as a parent, I cried throughout the whole book. And I'm deep in the weeds on this, but it's a beautiful book. My, f um, my favorite book on trauma is that top middle one called The Body Keeps the Score. So for those of you who take care of human beings, like in any role whatsoever, that trauma piece, you've got to get better at it because its impact on people is so under-recognized. I read that book all the time. It is the book that has changed me as a person and as a doctor more than any other book in the last 20 years. So the body keeps the score. This is a, I'm going to leave this slide up, and afterwards you can just take a picture with your smartphone. This is, these are all great books on addiction. I have a website because one of my kids made me a website, um, and it's ruthpotee.com. And a lot of my videos, this talk is on there. So if you want to give this talk but you want to practice, ahead of time and remind yourself about the slides or you're a health teacher and you just want to give the stuff on marijuana or in any other setting you're going to talk to Kiwanis about this you can go there the slide decks themselves aren't there because they're too big but your Scott's going to post the slide deck for you um, it has a calendar on it of where I'm speaking um, but these are the books I think would be really great I would love to answer questions from anybody in this audience anybody have questions or thoughts yeah Oh yeah, it's hard to read. Bessel van der Kolk. It's, um, when you're, I'm gonna leave it here. When you're done, you can come up and stare at it. But he is a Boston psychiatrist who's really uh, the leader on this stuff. Bessel van der Kolk. Do you know him? Does anybody know him? He's amazing. I've gone to see him speak. Um, he's extraordinary. What other questions do people have? Yeah. I don't have a question, but I just wanna make a comment. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, yes. No so the boards of health are making some recommendations about reducing exposure. They've got a good, they have good. A panel of all of, of interdisciplinary yep. panels that are coming up with Yes, the Cannabinoid Commission, that's what we're talking about. And the Cannabinoid Commission got put in place as of September. And it looks like there's some really good people, and they're coming up with the guidelines. And if we were doing it, we would come up with all of that. And I would also say I would personally want to limit on THC. Right? I don't need THC of 90%. Seriously, how high do you need to get? Yeah, so my hope is they put a limit on THC, and they really put a limit on the look-alike candies that are targeting our kids. I think that's critical. And, you know, again, if I was the goddess of the universe, you'd have to be 25 to walk in there, right? That's the other thing I would change. They are not going to change that because that was on the ballot measure, but in my magic wand world, that's what I would do. 
What other thoughts or questions do people have? That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has anybody, I'm not trying to call anybody out, has anybody in this room ever been in a medical marijuana dispensary? There's not that many out here. There's one in Northampton, I think. There's one in Springfield, maybe? Is there one, another one closer by that you guys know about? Wow, Northampton's the closest. So there's been very little in the way of rollout of medical marijuana. So I've been in them because when I, um, we started certifying people for medical marijuana if they had very specific conditions. So if you're 21 and you walk in and you're like, I can't sleep and I have anxiety, we're not certifying. You have to be 25 for us to certify you. And you have to have very specific conditions that are pretty bad. And actually, not many people meet our standards. If you have chronic pain and I can reduce your opiate use by a certain margin, I will convert it to medical marijuana. Because I do think opiates long term have more harm than likely medical marijuana does. So in a medical marijuana store, there's a variety of strains that are available to you. They tend to be lower THC and higher other cannabinoids. There are hundreds of cannabinoids in marijuana. It's an incredibly complicated chemical, actually, really complicated. And depending on what your need is, they might suggest to you. No, nobody there is medical, right? They're all sort of like young, pierced people who will hear your symptoms. Not judging. There's no judgment for me. Uh, but they will hear your symptoms and say, I'm, I'm here because I cannot sleep at night, and I cannot sleep because I have multiple sclerosis, and I have a lot of muscle spasticity. And they will hear that and say, well, in my experience, the indica strain used as a tincture under the tongue might provide you some relief, so let's try that. It happens to have, I'm making this part up because I don't know that much, but it happens to be fairly low on the THC, and it's high in these other connections. In general, the medical marijuana stores are not selling stuff that get people wicked high, because what's the point of that? I'm trying to help my little old ladies who have cancer who can't stop vomiting. They don't want to be high. They want to enjoy their grandkids while they get through chemo, right? So the medical marijuana strains that are being grown are intended for medical use. Now, that is not what is going to be grown for recreational use. We, I can't say that strongly enough. Do you remember that slide that showed you the whoop of THC? And the flat line was other cannabinoids, right? There's been no growth in that market. Nobody, no, nobody wants to buy that product, right? My little old ladies who can't stop vomiting, they want that product. So what we know is what is going to be sold is high, high, high THC stuff. But the medical marijuana stores, I think, have some benefit, without a doubt. I, I do think they help people. Um, so, yeah. So we, we, uh, we have a grow facility that will open about a month. In Monson? Um, oh. Yeah, so in 2013, Monson passed a bylaw that allowed medical marijuana by right in yep. certain uh, zones. So in yep. Monson, it's commercial and industrial. So we have one go through the planning process. It will open, uh, it's supposed to be open in September, but it's going to be open about a month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the legislature goes back and says, if you already have a medical mm -hmm. dispensary, mm -hmm. or RMDD mm -hmm. license, you can now grow for... Yes, yep. So you guys got sort of, you got suckered into this a little bit a little for bit. the whole thing, yep. Well, mm -hmm. well, and, and so the, the concern is that, well, for months and currently, risk is lower because this is only a grow. Yep, it's a grow, yep. Right, right. So, but, but now we have that weird law where you have to pass a ballot initiative, which is already passed it once, which is totally different than any other municipal process ever, yep. for whatever reason. Yep. So, from a policy standpoint, I think it's going to be really difficult to make any headway if you're, if you're a community that's already voted yes. Yep. It's going to be hard. The, the towns that voted yes, it's really hard to reverse that. You just, and, and it was a very complicated legislative decision that made the split. So towns that voted no, the select board can just thumbs down. And that's been much more straightforward. And I think something like 106 towns in Massachusetts have, 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 have already voted it out. So a lot of towns are saying no. Um, so I understand growing up again in an economically um, 
core area, my little town of Athol actually has a grow facility coming in too, because there's, there's tax money there, right? There's real tax money that is, I hope, benefits the town. And I would love some of that darn tax money to go to prevention and go to education, and I hope they do that. Are you guys hearing him in back? Stand up and turn around, because this guy knows what he's talking about. Stand up. Come on. You want my mic? Come and take my mic. Come here. No, stand right there. I love it. It has a long, long thread. OK. Hi. So I'm Evan. I'm the town administrator. Hi. I was just up here on Monday doing the same thing. <laughs> so maybe nobody will yell at me today. So. Um, uh, we, we do have a grow facility, and what we were talking about is what's called a host community agreement. So I just finished negotiating that on uh, Tuesday. And so what that does for the town is, is twofold. So the, and the select board will be voting this next, next Tuesday. Um, so we, we negotiated uh, what's called the host community agreement because in Massachusetts, these are all nonprofit facilities, which is uh, oddly strange as well. Um, so what happens is one of two things, either they have two companies connected to the same person, which one is a real estate company and one is a medical marijuana facility. And so they buy the property in the real estate company and they lease it to the medical marijuana facility so that you still get tax revenue. Or you can create what's called the host agreement. And so our host agreement is 2.5% uh, of gross revenue. Uh, their estimated gross revenue is $30 million. So that uh, is anywhere between $345,000 and $600,000 a year for the town of Munson, uh, which is pretty good. Um, we could probably build a spray park with that money, but that's a different <laughs> conversation. Um, so, and then the other thing we did is we have the... Oh, can, no, no, that's cool. That's cool. Um, you could just go read it all on Facebook. It's fine. Um, so the, uh, the other thing that we did was we, we set aside $15,000 that's totally separate from the, the pilot agreement, really, um, for opioid addiction programming or, or substance abuse programming. Um, so it's not a ton of money, but it's, you know, it's 100% more money than we've ever had for this. So we, we do have our, our group, which was the Opioid Addiction Task Force, which has now got a different, long, longer name. Right. So we have that. And we, we all meet monthly currently, and we're, we're going to be bringing on more of this type of program and hopefully some other kind of direct impact stuff. But we're hoping that $15,000 is just the start, and then we can build from there. But uh, we wanted to carve that out so that it's not a kind of town meeting or, or select board pot of money that isn't guaranteed to go to where we you know, would want it to go. So that's all. Thanks. That's very helpful, actually, and I, I just learned from him, too. So I, I totally get why a town like this would do it. I totally get it. And, and yet I also want you guys to have some control. And so you're hearing that this grow facility already has its three sites, so they can't open a site here, right? But anybody else at this point still can. And, and what we want to have be the case that it, you know, the place is tightly controlled. Do you know it's really hard to walk into a liquor store if you're under the age of 21 and buy liquor? It really is really, really, really hard. I, I don't know. Have you done that before? You haven't tried that. Let me, yeah, no. Nor should you because this is what the Alcohol and Drug Task Force, and that's not what it's called, of the state does. They send in shoppers all week long to make sure that you are doing the right thing and they will pull your liquor license in one second, right? Back in the old days, right? Back in the 80s when I was in high school, First of all, the legal age of drinking in New Hampshire was 18. Did anybody do a New Hampshire run? It was probably far for you, but I, I grew up closer to the border. My point is it was really easy to get liquor. It's a lot harder. We have got to make sure these marijuana stores are so tightly managed and that they're not showing little cartoon figures and lollipops in their window and things that are luring our kids in. For those of you who've never even driven by the medical marijuana dispensary in Northampton, it's in this cinder block building. I actually drove by it like 12 times when I was trying to go to it because it has no sign. It was really hard to find. It is not enticing. Now, having said that, within six months of its opening, medical marijuana, it was clear medical marijuana because it has a, we know exactly how it's branded, was all throughout Northampton High School, everywhere meaning that people got medical marijuana and then they sold it, right? So it will end up in our high schools. I know this for a fact, it's just where we're headed. I am gonna say something about the growth facilities, which is 
I know people say it's all organic and good. It's actually unbelievably unenvironmental. It takes a tremendous amount of electricity and a tremendous amount of water to grow marijuana. Huge. Something like 17% of California's water is going to grow marijuana right now. So don't think this is an environmental practice. This is not growing in the nice green Connecticut fields, guys. This is growing in a giant factory under 24-hour lights. And um, you know this is not helping our planet. So I would encourage that place to have solar panels everywhere, right? Or else all of your, your water bills and, uh, are going to start to go up. I, have, I didn't show it here, but I have several of the... Uh, there's a great Mother Jones article. If you Google it, Mother Jones in like the environmental impact of marijuana, it blew my mind when I read it because it was it's so unenvironmental. Okay, what other thoughts or questions do you guys have? Anything else? You're kind of a quiet audience. Did I depress you? Did I worry you? I was thinking about the alcohol when you were talking about the gummy bears and the candy and alcohol has the same compare that to all the new alcohol that has the root beer and the, the creamsicle alcohol. Yes. You know, yeah. Beer. It is, right. So what she was just saying is that the alcohol industry has gotten really, um, it's really shifted. And you know, I mean, again, not to go into the detail, but you go to the vodka aisle and there's like, you know, toasted marshmallow flavored vodka. And you're thinking, what the heck is this stuff, right? But again, I think it's actually the feminization of alcohol. I think it's sort of making it more available to women and, and possibly to kids. But again, kids can't buy the stuff, not easily, though they may go into your home liquor cabinet and see toasted marshmallow vodka and be like, awesome, I'm in on that plan, right? Um, but it is, it's targeting it to different audiences. It's concerning. You had a question, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the question was about buprenorphine, also called the brand name Suboxone, which is how most people hear about it. Um, so when, when the brain is disrupted and you have these opiate receptors that are dying to have something in it, and in fact, literally, it is telling you if you don't do this, you will die, right? That's what addiction does to you. You are desperate to fill it with anything. And when we use any of the medicines that help fill the re opiate receptors, whether it's methadone or buprenorphine, the cravings go down. Some, for some people, they go to zero. And when we get people stable in methadone or buprenorphine, or for some people they use the um, naltrexone shot, which doesn't fill the receptor, it actually builds a wall up, their cravings go down, their use goes down, they can get their lives back on track. So all day long, I take care of people who are doing great, right? They are carpenters and police officers and nurses, and they're all good. They have, they have money in their bank account. They do not have hepatitis C. They're living a nice, normal, healthy life, and things are on track. But when I met them four years ago, they're a mess. So say that again. So in general, when I talk to people about length of treatment with buprenorphine or Suboxone, um, I say, in general, it takes about 18 to 24 months for your dopamine stuff in your brain to get better. The length of treatment is how long it takes for you to get your life back, right? So, and I don't judge it. When I talk to my diabetics, I don't say to them, uh, I'm giving you six months to get off your metformin, because a lot of my people could get off their metformin, really. They just need to lose 29 pounds, start exercising an hour and a half a day, and cut out all the sugar. But you know what that? That's hard to do. That is a hard thing to do, and most of my diabetics don't ever do that, ever, right? They lose five pounds, they gain five pounds. So the length of treatment is I look at people and I say, man, you are doing great. You have been working this so hard. You've been doing great for the last 18, 24 months. You have money in your bank account. You're back in school. You're in a great relationship. You're going to the gym every day. What do you think about weaning? And I have people look at me sometimes and say, I can't do it, I'm not ready, I have a baby on the way, I'm stressed out. I'm like, that's fine, no problem. And other times they'll say, yeah, I'm ready to go. And then I say, okay, let's talk about the weaning plan. And then it takes me a while to wean people off, sometimes nine months or a year. So I have people who've been on it for years and I think it is better for them to stay on that medicine than ever get off because they're doing fine. And then I have people, particularly my younger people whose lives are going great and I slowly wean them off and then they're done. And then I miss seeing them all the time. Um, so. I think it concerns people. People think, you're just replacing one drug with another. But again, I'm replacing the fact that your hypertension part of your uh, kidneys isn't working really well when I give you an ACE inhibitor and an angiotensin receptor blocker, and you guys aren't all flipping out on me about that. We have a, a part of the brain that is broken. I am trying to quiet down the cravings. I'm trying to prevent you from dying, getting hepatitis C or HIV. I'm trying to prevent you from going to jail and costing the, the American healthcare system and correctional system a lot of money. 
So I am a big believer in medical assisted treatment. But the truth is I'm a big believer in everything. I believe there's 100 ways to get better and sometimes you have to activate 98 of those ways. But when I get the rigid thinkers with me and they say to me, you gotta go to 90 meetings in 90 days and it's the only way to get sober, I say, look, my friends, there's no evidence behind that. You, got it. you can't be judgmental when it comes to any disease. You need to be open-minded about what it takes to get better, right? If I had a magic wand, I would ship everybody off to the middle of nowhere, and they would do yoga, and they'd meditate, and they'd eat organic food, and they'd grow their own eggs, blah, 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 right? I would make these fantasy worlds, and everybody would get better. But that's not the world we live in. People have to go to work. They only have a so much amount of money. They have sick people. You've got to meet them where they are. So I'm a big believer in, in buprenorphine and in methadone. I don't find naltrexone works as well. People like naltrexone. The jails like naltrexone. The judges like naltrexone because it's not an opiate. They don't like the replacement, right? But if the studies show that it only works 20% of the time, and the studies show that buprenorphine works 60% of the time, how can I sit there and say it's an equivalent drug? It isn't, right? For the people for whom it works, it works 100% of the time. Right, but most of my people it doesn't work for. So for alcohol, I use it a lot for alcohol. I find good success with naltrexone, also known as the Vivitrol shot for alcohol. You guys should push the Wing Memorial Hospital to do more addiction care. Bay State has not been leading this effort at all. And I, I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine at Bay State Franklin and Greenfield, so I actually, I sort of, I don't work for them at all, I'm part of them, but I don't think Bay State has led this. It's, they've been a disappointment to me. Honestly, the hospital's not led this. Holyoke Hospital's done a really good job. They're way ahead of the game. Um, and I give them a lot of credit for that. But we should, if you work for Bay State, if you know people out there, you should start pushing them. People are dying, right? And they should be doing a better job. Yeah. You do it. Awesome. You know, Mercy, Mercy's way ahead. I totally agree with that. Totally. And in fact, Mercy doctors were doing buprenorphine treatment way earlier than anybody else. So I have a fr my friend is the head of the hospital service at Mercy, and um, you guys are way ahead of the game. And you guys should be promoting yourself. Honestly, you guys should take out an ad saying we're doing a really good job on addiction. And I, you know, throw Bay State under the bus because I'm pissed at them. They're the big player. They should be doing a better job, right? I mean, part of this is about us getting angry. It is. It's about us finding some of the stuff outrageous. Yeah. The question is, does Mary Lane have a... Was it run out of Mary Lane? That there was a... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know since, I mean, Mary Lane functions as what now, an urgent care or something or other? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when Bay State, Bay, when, it, when Mary Lane closed, I, you know, it was, it's devastating to the town of Ware. Ware really struggles. I mean, we all, there's lots of our areas that have big trouble. Ware is no, no shortage of that. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. But I could tell you that, you know, Holyoke Health Center is opening up, Holyoke Medical Center, the hospital, is opening up a, a buprenorphine clinic based at the hospital. And um, they're going to be starting buprenorphine or Suboxone in the emergency room. Because you know what would help that young 24-year-old with an overdose that day? If we held on to her and we immediately started her, not immediate because you can't do it that way, but very fast we gave her either methadone or buprenorphine. We would have gotten her out of withdrawal and we would have gotten her stable. And the studies show that if you start Suboxone in an emergency room setting, just a seven day script with a warm handoff to a community provider, 80% of people are in care 30 days later, right? That's a good number. If you don't give them anything, none of them are in care, right? And in fact, they're likely to die again. So I, I get mad at emergency rooms. I've been, you think I haven't talked to the doctors about this? I'm yelling at them all the time. Yeah. I love hearing that. I tell you, you guys should be advertising that. I want Holyoke and Mercy to say, hey, we are responding to this opiate epidemic in the following ways. It should be in the paper and there should be an article. I think Bay State needs to be shamed into this because they are moving damn slow. Okay. Yeah, Scott. Come here. Versus, well, no, are you asking a question?
for being able to prosecute cases for, for overprescribing and things like that. Did anybody see that 60 Minutes? It was about a month ago now. It was unbelievable. I was, I'm outraged all the time, but I was newly outraged in brand new ways because it's crazy. It is all crazy. And I tell you, follow the money, right? This whole thing is about follow the money. And you know, I just hope there's a whole fresh group of lawsuits that goes to treatment on this stuff because the pharmaceutical industry has made billions of dollars on the backs of people who are now dying. Yeah, I totally agree. This, we will fix this problem from the ground up. I totally agree with Scott. No, there's not going to be any white horse coming to rescue us, either at the state level or federal. Totally agree on that. Anyway, I love being back in a really a very familiar place to me. Thanks for having me tonight. Thanks.